We want to put out content as much as we can and educate people. So when you ask the question, how do you get 45 year old guys and ladies to squat, to back squat, to not just that, but usually to spend two, three, four, five thousand dollars on a home gym. And the home gym is barbells and squat racks and platforms and bumper plates, you know, and it's because we've we've grabbed them ahead of time with the content. You're listening to Barbell Logic, brought to you by Barbell Logic Online Coaching, where each week we take a systematic walk through strength training and the refining power of voluntary hardship. Welcome back to Barbell Logic. This is producer Trent, and you're hearing my voice because we are doing something a little bit different from our usual thing today. We are airing an interview that Matt gave with the friendly folks over at True Coach. Of course, True Coach is the software that powers a lot of the behind the scenes activity that happens at Barbell Logic. So, those of you who are clients with Barbell Logic know that True Coach is kind of the hub where all of the communication takes place. So, coaches post the lifters programming on there, lifters upload videos of the workouts for form checks. Coaches provide form feedback there. They also do nutrition coaching via True Coach. So there's a lot of stuff that happens at True Coach, and we thought it'd be cool to share some of the history that Matt has with the company. You know, Barbell Logic has been with True Coach for nearly four years now. In fact, Barbell Logic was one of the beta testers of the software back in 2016. So Barbell Logic has been with True Coach from nearly the beginning. And in that process, Matt has also developed a close personal relationship with the leadership team at True Coach. Casey Jinks, who is the founder of True Coach, and then who we're going to hear from today, Sam Pogue, who is the vice president of branding at True Coach. So again, this interview first aired on True Coach TV. If you want to go check that out and you want to read more about Matt's journey building Barbell Logic with and alongside True Coach, then I will leave some links in the show notes. In the meantime, enjoy the show. What's up, everybody? Welcome to True Coach TV. I'm your host, Sam Pogue. I'm sitting here in beautiful Boulder, Colorado still, because we're all still in our homes, and getting to sit down with the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Matt Reynolds, uh, founder and owner of Barbell Logic, uh, and uh, recent experiencer of the virus himself, and has just recently sure. been released from quarantine. And uh, these guys, they run a program, they run a coaching business, and they do such an excellent job with the element of coaching their clients that I really was really excited for Matt to share not only the philosophy behind what Barbell Logic brings uh, as a business, but what they help reinforce with their coaches to get such a great compliance rate, which is so important in the remote coaching space, and retention rate. And these guys are primarily using a barbell in a setting, and right now we are not in a setting where everybody has one. And for them, they, it shows because their coaches have built such great relationships with their clients that it's just business as usual. And these guys have done such a great job really living up to what that word means is coach. And so really excited to have Matt on. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Uh, and uh, so glad you're healthy enough to do it. Thanks, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's, uh, it was weird. I was one of the early uh, COVID-19 positive people in the United States. And so did a lot of travel. I travel quite a bit for business and uh, got it, caught it traveling and, um, you know, was sick for, with flu-like symptoms for about nine days at the very beginning of March. And then, uh, started to get the respiratory stuff and finally was able to get into the hospital and get tested, tested positive. I ended up having to be in the hospital for a few days with, uh, with pretty bad pneumonia. And I'm a, you know, I'm a pretty healthy guy. I'm 41 years old. I'm a, I'm a lifter. I've been a, a, a professional strong man and a competitive power lifter for years. And, um, you know, it's, it's surprising, not me on my butt for a few days for sure. Uh, oddly enough, my wife was the only person I gave it to, uh, and she was completely asymptomatic the entire time. So she really never had any symptoms at all was never sick. Um, and so, yeah, we were officially declared healed or recovered by the CDC uh, about two weeks ago now, somewhere in there. So it's, uh, but it was, it was a rough two weeks for sure. But yeah, all, all has gone well. And uh, it's allowed me to get back to focus on the business for sure. Well, go into that a little bit for us, please. Tell us a little bit about what, why you have to travel so much or why you're on airplanes and traveling so much and, and what Barbell Logic is for those people who may not have heard of it before. Sure. But uh, Barbell Logic is a, is a business I started back in early 2016. And, and really what we do is we connect world-class strength coaches with people who want world-class tra- strength coaches. And so um, we'll talk about this a lot more. That we are, we are form Nazis. We are form people. 
And so certainly programming is a huge part of that. Um, we push true coach software about as hard as you can possibly push it because we are breaking down multiple videos, every single workout, every single day within 24 hours. And so, yeah, we, we put a lot of emphasis on biomechanics and physics of the lifts, how to perform things like the squat, the deadlift, the bench press, and the press. Those four lifts are really the, the basis of what we do. It's certainly not the only thing we do. Uh, we do body weight training. We do things like cleans and snatches. We do rows and, and all those kind of big, big boy lifts as well. And certainly there's a place for everything. And we do cardio as well and, and hit type training, or we, we help prepare people for endurance type events or, you know, Spartan type runs. And so that, that all works well, but we, we very much are focused on performance first and aesthetics as a byproduct of that performance. And then I think the thing that would separate us from other coaches or businesses that, that maybe run like a CrossFit type model of that would also say their performance first is that our demographic skews a little older. And so we tend to be in the, in the 35 to 55 year old range um, which is probably not where most of your coaches are. Most of your coaches are probably honed in more on the 20 and 30 somethings. Um, I tell you what though, as you go into a crisis like this, the fact that the majority of our, of our, our primary demographic for our business is upper middle class or upper class sort of executive men and women who don't get hit quite as hard by a financial crisis like this. And so we've done really well. We were, we were up about seven, seven and a half percent in March over February um, we are on track for the same sort of thing in April. And then, you know, I certainly, I don't have delusions of grandeur. This may last a while and it may hurt us a little bit, but we're in a position where we're, we're pretty safe. We've done well with stewarding our money. Well, we are profitable and cash positive. And so, um, you know, we're okay. My, my concern is much more at the micro level for our, for our actual clients and actual coaches. So, you know, I've, I've got young coaches who coach young people and a lot of those young people are in the service industry. And so, my worry is what do we do with my, I'm, we're not going to have to lay off anybody. We're not going to have to furlough anybody, but what do you do with a coach who has 25 clients and they lose 10 of them because they're all, those 10 are all in their twenties and they're waiters and waitresses and whatnot. And so that is at the forefront of our concern right now. Same thing with our, our clients. We are concerned about the clients who have lost access to their gyms. Um, we are more concerned about the clients who have, who have lost their jobs or been furloughed or laid off. Um, and then I'm, I'm concerned about clients who are sick and, you know, after having this thing, um, it was about three and a half weeks of no training for me. And I, I love to train. I've got a great home gym and train my home gym. And so, um, you know, if you get this, you can't train. And so, you know, for, for us to, to answer that question a little deeper, we, we spend a lot of time trying to make emotional deposits into our clients 401k. And I, I think that with a business like ours, it's so heavily barbell driven. Um, we have about 60% of our clients that train at home, 40% train at gyms. Um, so we, we do have a lot of, of, of people that train at home, but still 40% that train at gyms and there are no gyms open. And so if you train at a gym, you don't, you're not able to squat and deadlift and bench press and press right now because you're at your house or your apartment. And so but I think with the connection and the focus on uh, relationships and the way we build relationships with our clients and between our clients and coaches, that when you get into a place like this, there is some, there's some money in that 401k, right? We've built that up just a little bit. And so um, that emotional 401k with our clients. And so we're able to then transition them into things like body weight training, training with bands, kettlebells, adjustable dumbbells, 50 pound bags of dog food whatever they can get their hands on and they can still train in this downtime at their house. And, and so for us, the programming while they're at home looks more like systematic progressive training. So rather than that standard sort of, you know, hopper idea of let's just like stick our hand in a bucket and pull out the workout of the day from home, we are still making, making very clear linear progression with our clients. And at the gym, that linear progression is almost always, we're going to add a little weight. We're going to add a little weight. We're going to add a little weight. That's, we're going to tend to try to get stronger. That's what we do. We can't do that right now while people are at home, but what we can do is we can add volume. We can add frequency. We can add density, right? So you can do more work in the same amount of time, like all of those things. And so we're progressively still adding stress because we want to be clear to our clients that we, what we're trying to do is train, not exercise. And so even though right now it sort of feels like exercise and it's certainly probably not the quality of training that most people have been able to do in the past, 
it's still pretty good and it's going to slow down that detraining effect. And so when they go back to the gyms, they're going to have a nice sort of base of uh, aerobic base of work capacity. And they're going to be able to go in and probably handle those squats and deadlifts and bench presses and presses a little better, certainly than if they had just sat at home and, and eaten Krispy Kreme donuts and ordered DoorDash for six straight weeks. So. Yeah, hundred percent. No. And, and I mean, that gets into the root, like the root game of what our industry is, is that's, you know, as a coach in, in strength conditioning as being a personal trainer, whatever title you want to give it is we facilitate the management of stress and how often that stress comes in and out and whatever delivery tool, sometimes it's a sandbag and sometimes it's a barbell. And uh, which one did you do first, powerlifting or a strongman? I did powerlifting and I did that from 99 till about 2005. 2005, I got interested in strongman. You know, powerlifting is all the same kind of, it's a it's squat bench and deadlift. That's what it is. Yeah. And I loved it and still love it and have gone back to powerlifting in my sort of master's years. Um, and I got an instrument in 2005, I actually won my pro card at the same show as Brian Shaw. Uh, so Brian and I won our pro cards together and then, um, cool. competed on, I competed on the world strongman circuit, uh, the pro circuit for three and a half years, uh, opened a gym in 2008, uh, called strong gym, grew that gym really almost accidentally. I was a teacher and had finished my master's to be a principal. Uh, the gym was just kind of a place for all the power leaders and strongmen, strongmen in my area to train, which obviously there's not a ton of those people. So again, no, no delusions of grandeur on, on business there, but the thing grew and we were able to market that style of training to normal people, um, to those business, business executives and soccer moms. And so the gym grew. And so by the time we got to about 2012, it was one of the largest uh, strength gyms in the country. And it was super nice. It was kind of part of the deal. It was that it had that feel of like a boutique high-end gym, but people trained like powerlifters and strongmen there. And so it's kind of the best of both worlds. Um, I sold it at the end of 15 and then started full-time online coaching January of 16. And so the business has grown tremendously. It's, you know, we, we, uh, I think that my first year I did a little under 150 grand in, in revenue that first year. And, and we're in the multiples of, of millions of dollars of revenue now um, in 2019. And so uh, staff of about 70 people at this point, um, and love it, man. I just love what we do. And, and, you know, certainly it's been an incredible blessing during a thing like this to be able to, to work from home. Uh, you know, I, I've thought a lot about what would it look like if I still, if I still own that gym, yeah. gyms closed, no revenue coming in. And that gym was a big gym. I brought in a fair amount of revenue, but it wasn't super net profitable. It was profitable, but it was a huge building and we own the building itself and it was 15,000 square feet. And man, it's nice being able to work from home hunker down during this quarantine time. And, and for us, we're, we're Midwestern people. And so I, I can live well living in the Midwest and we homeschool our kids and we're, my wife's a stay at home mom and, and we, it's not that different for us. So certainly being sick with the virus was a little bit weird, but <laughs> once we got, once we got better, yeah. um, life's kind of normal for us. So it's, it's not that hard. So all that traveling you were doing, you were, you're teaching a seminar, you teach a workshop. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I teach seminars and then I, I speak a lot of times publicly. So I get asked to to public speak, um, I was actually at a, at a big men's conference in Atlanta for influencers, guys that are, you know, have like massive YouTube channels and massive Instagram channels or whatever. And so I'm, I'm kind of the fitness guy there and I train a lot of those guys. So, um, you know, like guys like uh, Brett McKay from Art of Manliness or th these guys that just have like, you know, multiple millions of followers. Um, are a lot of those guys are just down to earth dudes. And so I, yeah. I train them. I'm their coach. They, they, they are clients on true coach and they love working through it. And, um, so I, I get to go out and speak to those guys. And then we do a lot of seminars as well. So at this point, one of the things we've not necessarily a pivot, but an added thing that, that we've done over the last few years is we have an Academy now where we're training people to become expert coaches. So one of the problems we saw was that the bottleneck for our business is obviously at some point, the, the demand outstrips the supply. If I'm trying to connect true expert coaches and not just, not just the verbiage of saying like, Hey, they're an expert coach. Like these people are expert, unbelievable coaches. If I'm connecting people of that caliber with people who want it. And because of the internet, anybody who can afford it has access to it. The bottleneck is in the expert coaches. At some point I run out of expert coaches. And so we saw that several years ago, we started to develop the curriculum to train up. We started basically with our own clients that were interested and then that's now expanded out. And so we have a, a tremendous system. It's six months. It's a six month program, uh, our coaching Academy, and we train people. And it's basically like a, a very immersive, very intense study of how to become a master strength and conditioning coach after that six month period. Now, 
it's all online. So the question is, how well can you coach after six months of everything you've done is, is online? Certainly, they've got to turn in some videos and things of them coaching people in person. But at that point, we take them under our wing. We bring them on as interns if they've done very, very well in the academy. And they get to see thousands of reps online. And then we start to work with them with in-person coaches. So we just get rep after rep. That stuff you can't buy, that experience. And so lots of experience. Then we, then we do a seminar where they've got to pass a, an in-person practical. And it's, it's very hard to pass. It's got a very uh, low pass rate, extremely high standard. They've got to do a written test. And they've got to do an oral test to pass. They've got to pass all three of those to become a professional barbell coach and work for us. And so... Um, but it's been nice because the, you know, I don't ever have to interview anybody because we have these, we have people who come in as students for the academy. If they do very well as students and they're basically a, you know, a quote unquote, a student and they turn in great assignments and do great work and they interact and do the zoom calls, then we'll invite them to be an intern and we pay our interns. It's not free work. So we pay them, but it's, you know, it's, it's not great pay. They come in and work and then I get to see how they work. And if they work really well and they do really well, and then they go past their certification They've already proven to me that they have great work ethic, that they're part of the team, they're, they're on the Slack channels with the team, and so it works great. And so I just get to welcome them into the family and make them a full staff coach. So that's how we've grown the staff, and I've never had to do an interview with a coach. To inter- how, how well could you interview a coach anyway? And be like, like, if I were interviewing you right now, Sam, I'm trying to figure out if you were a great strength coach, that's very difficult to do over a phone call. I need to see it, you know? And so we've been able to do that with our, with our uh, coaches. So, so – both certainly about 80% of our revenue right now is from online coaching and, and about 20% of our revenue is from the, the making coaches and the, the academy. So is the academy an invite only thing or is there something nope. that coaches who nope. want to learn more about programming? Because clearly you guys are teaching a really good system around it. Yeah, absolutely. So nope, the academy is the thing. What's nice about this is that anybody can do the academy. Academy is like going to school. And so it's 179 bucks a month. It's pretty cheap. That's a, and it's only a six month. It's not a six month commitment. It's a six month class. And you're in there usually somewhere between six and 10 other students with a phenomenal master coach professor, great curriculum, phone call, a Zoom call, about a two hour Zoom call once every week. Um, It's just been tremendous. And so anybody can do that. And then really that is sort of fairly competitive because you've got a bunch of students in the academy and they're all competing to try to get the invite to be an intern. So that's where the invite comes in. So the top of the classes of the academy get invited to be interns at Barbell Logic Online Coaching. And then we take you under our wing and do everything we can to develop your eye as a coach and help you pass the certification. And then because we want more coaches, um, but we're not going to dumb down the standard to get there. So totally. it's worked really well. You know, a lot, a lot of coaches right now are probably feeling the lack of not having a community or having a system in play. Right. And that's the big thing is like, okay, well, most it's so easy to get into this field that all of a sudden, unless you have good mentors right out of the gate that, Hey, this is kind of the direction your training should look. And this is what programming looks like that you really have a grasp of what's going on. And so I, I want coaches to know that there is, if you're in this space and maybe you do love the barbell and you do love strength training and you want to work with athletes and you want to provide this experience, well, maybe you had a hard time getting going on your own to where, okay, this might be a great opportunity for you to learn and be a part of a system that teaches you how to be successful. Uh, and these guys have done it so well. And, and, you know, especially, you know, I would think a great lesson here from them too, is that like, okay, you look at barbell and strength training is a smaller audience than let's say Zumba, <clears throat> right? And just overall people who are into the doing it on a regular basis. And that doesn't mean that there's less people for them to work with in that they don't have a business, right? Being more specific with their message. Like you, like you heard Matt say, we want world-class strength coaches who want to work with world-class strength athletes or athletes who want to train like world-class strength athletes. Yeah. In fact, and just to be clear, like that's true on the strength coaches, but I think I almost hate saying it this way. Our primary demographic is incredibly ordinary, normal people. And so, and so that, and that's the thing. And yes, we do want our 45 year old executives to think of themselves as, as athletes. But the reality is, is that the vast majority of these people are very normal business professionals, soccer moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas, so on and so forth. So yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but okay, yeah, that, that's, it's interesting. And, and when you think about that, and this is the thing from the business perspective. And again, I don't know how many people are gonna listen to this that, that don't really have their demographic set yet, but I would, <laughs> I would urge you, what, so many people wanna train athletes. They love it. And I get it. Athletes are a blast. I've trained 
I've trained world-class powerlifters, world-class crossfitters, Olympic weightlifters, strong men. I, I was a head strength coach of a, of a giant high school for 10 years. So I had lots of students come through that were phenomenal athletes and went on to be, to be division one athletes and whatnot. Lots of my friends are division one strength coaches at major, major, major universities. I don't want to train athletes. Let, here, let me tell you why. One, they're genetic freaks. So you don't know if you're a good coach. And listen, you know this, right? So because every freaky athlete does bigger, faster, stronger in high school or the Oklahoma program, it doesn't matter what program they do. They're freaks because they're freaks. So it does, you have no idea if your programming is any good because these people are all incredible. Hey, train an 82 year old lady. That'll tell you if you're a good coach. And here, and let me, and let me I, I promise you, I'm like the least greedy business owner you'll ever meet. But here's the deal. 20 and 30 something athletes are broke. Mm -hmm. They have high turnover rate mm -hmm. and middle class, normal people are more settled in their life. Mm -hmm. They don't leave. Listen, our churn is 4% per month. It's insanely low. In February is 3.3. In March last month, it was 4.4 in the middle of COVID. Now, I mean, think about that. We lost 4.4% of our clients. That's insanely low in the middle of a massive disaster where 10 million people filed for unemployment, right? Where 200,000 people got the actual disease in our country and we were able to keep our clients because the demographic was one that were settled and they can pay for the thing and they weren't going to leave and they weren't going to get tired of what you do and go off and do hot yoga or go off and do CrossFit or go. And there's nothing wrong with any of those things. It's just that that's what you see out of a younger generation. They're like, let me try this thing for three or four months and then I'll move. So I have, I've been interested in these other, you know, I've got friends that, that own and run other online coaching businesses that focus on athletes. Mm -hmm. And I have wondered, and I, I just don't like prying on their business, but like, how's the business right now? You know, because if the bulk of your demographic is 20 to 31 and they work in service industry and they're making $38,000 a year, they can't pay you right now because they're not working. And so we're in a pretty good position from a demographic standpoint to continue to be successful because we've chosen to work with those everyday normal people. 100%, right? And, you know, get guys working in the, and even in the sports performance business, like, I hear it all the time from kids. They're like, I want to work with pro athletes. I'm like, yeah, okay. The amount of people that get to work with the Jake Arrietas, the uh, Pat Mahomes, right, are the far and few between. Like, if you ain't doing a youth program <laughs> or most of these performance facilities have adult fitness programs for the youth athletes' parents, like, that's what keeps their bills afloat. Like, it's not going to come purely from athletes. So, no, I love it. Um, well, I, and think and, about if you're a coach. How much I'm, a, I'm in Missouri, right? So Pat Mahomes is like, you know, he's like God here. <laughs> if you're a coach and you really care about what you do, listen, I think I'm a great strength coach. Let me tell you how much better of an athlete I can make Pat Mahomes. Zero. Not at all, because he's, I can't do anything to make him better. But the 65-year-old guy who's got a disc degeneration in his back and he's had, a, he's had an ACL, you know, repair in his knee or maybe a knee replacement or whatever, I can literally change that guy's life. Yeah. I can make his quality of life better. And so I think you have to ask yourself what you really want to do is train professional athletes. And the question is, do you really want to do that because you want to ball with the athletes because you want to be able to post on Instagram like, hey, look at who I coach? Or do you actually want to change people's lives? And like I had to make a decision early on. Here's another secret that, you know, you're going to do this interview. And a lot of people are like, I've never even heard of Matt Reynolds or Barbell Logic. Perfect. It's not a cult of personality. It's, it's not about me. Man, I'm trying to build a business that changes people's lives on the back of expert coaches, not on me. It's not because if it's about me, if I die in a car accident tomorrow, my family doesn't get paid. My, my coaches don't get paid because it's about, it's about me. So I've, I've tried to build a business that's not about me, that's about the brand, that's about the coaches, that's about the quality of service, it's about the relationships that we build. And I think that's why we've done so well. And you know, we have positioned ourselves to grow the business to a point that it, it is going to be a potentially a, a, a massive business at some point. Um, it's a pretty good sized business now, and it's extremely successful. And I think it's because I don't have to be the guy on Instagram with Pat Mahomes with his arm around me being like, thanks, coach. I don't care. I would rather coach the 65-year-old guy and change his life. And, and not just the 65-year-old guy, but the 65-year-old guy times 2,000 more of those. And that's what we're able to do. Totally, totally. Well, you guys being a strength gym and working with the, uh, that more executive older population, how do you get the 45-year-old CEO to care about back squats and rows and bench press and overhead press? 
uh, and get them to care about meticulously giving a shit about their quality control week in, week out, and adjusting their lifestyle to live that. Like that's for a lot of people, I know that seems weird to get them to convince someone who's never done it before to do it. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question, actually. Uh, we put out a ton of content, and that content is always free, and that content is extremely high quality. And so, again, if, if you think about the demographic, Think about people, a lot of that younger demographic like in their 20s that go to like CrossFit gyms. A lot of those CrossFit or industrial style gyms, they're dirty and they're dusty and they're industrial buildings and they don't care because they're 24 years old and they're out there trying to sweat in their sports bras and their booty shorts and their tall socks or whatever, right? So like, but that's okay. Like, and I don't care when I train at a gym, like I don't need a gym like super, super clean. I'll go train at a hardcore gym. It doesn't matter, right? But, and I think a lot of times that content is the same sort of thing. You look at a lot of people on, on YouTube and and podcasts and like their content, the quality of the content sucks, but it speaks to the demographic of that 20 to 30 year old age group. What we've done is we've done the same thing. We've just, we've spoken to the demographic that we have. And so we have a podcast called Barbell Logic, which is, I think at this point, the, either the number one or within the top two strength podcasts in the world. It does several hundred thousand downloads a month. Uh, we're about to do episode number 300 on it. it it's very high quality. I mean, you know, people can listen now and you're recording me on Zoom. So the recording is not going to be tremendous, but like high end microphones, high end sound. It's expertly produced. We don't just turn on the recorder and then put the thing out. We have a professional producer that actually produces the podcast. YouTube videos on, on, on the Barba Logic channel, um, which are, again, extremely high, con high quality, you know, short on time, seven minutes or less. And so what we've done is we and then we've got an incredible editor in chief who writes a couple articles for us every single week on barbellogic.com. Again, it's they're they're very clean, very well written. This guy was an was an attorney and left his jobs. That's the other thing about my coaches. Like most of these coaches were engineers, attorneys, surgeons. You know, um, a, a guy that was a PhD of macroeconomics at Princeton, and he's like, and they're coaches for us. Right? Well, we, well, we pay well. It, and you don't, it's a part-time job. You can make yourself, you know, a hundred dollars an hour plus, uh, working in your underwear at home, drinking coffee. And so it works pretty well. So it appeals to that. And so what we've done is we've, Whoa, put, how did we not get the underwear coffee version of you? That's right. I, well, I, it is, you just can't see, I just got to get the polo on up top. Oh, okay. But, <laughs> so, and it's two in the afternoon. So I've switched to whiskey already. So okay, perfect. Right, I, get coffee early, I get up early. No, it's uh, you know, we just put out all that to me, there, there are content companies where, that's what they do. That's their primary driver of revenue. For us, content is the thing that drives people to the service. The service is the thing that makes the money. Yes. The revenue, the, the content is the thing we put out that drive people to that. And so our content will always be free. Yes. We may put out some books in the future and those books will be priced you know, right. But outside of the books, like our, our, we're never going to have a, a content behind a paywall. Mm -hmm. Articles are free. Videos are free. Podcast is free. I even did a, I did a master's class on programming uh, we have a system of programming we call minimum effective dose for maximum return on investment programming. It's about making just a single change to programming. So it's very systematic. And I did a master's class for that and in the academy. And we charged for that the first time. And I had, you know, a bunch of students in the class. They would ask me questions. Well, I ended up recording all those classes, sent it to my producer, had my producer cut it down. And we put it out as our podcast for eight episodes in a row, the eight classes. And we, you know, we pulled out the questions from the kids. It was a two hour class. We'd cut it down to a 40 minute podcast. It was the best, it was the best numbers we ever had on the podcast. And the okay. thing is, it all comes back to, could I have continued to run that class for a price? Yes, but that's not what we do. We want to put out content as much as we can and educate people. So when you ask the question, how do you get 45 year old guys and ladies to squat, to back squat, to not just that, but usually we are very pro home gym at, at Barbell Logic, usually to spend two, three, four, five thousand dollars on a home gym. And the home gym is barbells and squat racks and platforms and bumper plates, you know, those sort of things. And it's because we've we've grabbed them ahead of time with the content. They've read the they've read the articles, they've listened to the podcasts, they've watched the videos, and so. And because the quality of those things are very, very high, and that has nothing to do with me. It has to do with I've got a great video producer. I've got a great podcast producer. I've got an incredible editor-in-chief. Like Those people put out a tremendous high-quality content. They make me sound good, and they make me sound smart. Like It's incredible how many times I've done those video shoots, and I step all over myself and, you know, and can't – my tongue's all tied and twisted, and I can't get it out. And then it comes out, and, or I'm, and I look fat. I'm like, I look fat. And then the, <laughs> and the video producer comes out, and I'm just like, Actually, I look kind of jacked now. He's got a great, this guy's great with lighting. And you're just like, man, all right, this is what it's about. So 
you know, it's just, let's just be honest. That's what it is. Yeah. So, uh, so it works. So we're able to educate people and this sort of build mm-hmm. trust with people before they're full blown clients. Yeah. And then we continue that education process once they become clients and then they stay. Guys, if you guys have been following along the True Coach blog or some of the other interviews I've been doing, and you keep hearing the same story around this high quality service, you keep hearing around this idea around delivering content, delivering value, value, right? That, that's, I mean, the key thing. Did you keep hearing it in Matt's voice every time? Like, they give a fuck about the quality. Like, if you're going to do a podcast, like I have a podcast I travel with, and I'm going to have nice broadcast headsets. I have a nice Zoom, right? Like, I don't want the audio to suck because if it's crappy audio, you're not going to sit and listen to it, right? So, so, like, caring. And the fact that they do content, it's an acquisition strategy. It gives you, like, hey, you can trust us. We can be people that can help you get from A to B if this is the thing you do, and then this is what we do. Right. For you, this is a great example for all of you coaches out there who are listening to this. Go, how do I do something content related that's not just uh, Facebook and Instagram because I only have 10 clients? It's like, well, you need to put out some content of value that shows people you're an expert, that tells them that they can trust you. Right. And Matt's been doing this for, I don't want to age you, but more than a decade and uh, consistently. (laughs) Try to be nice. No, it's fine. I mean, it's that's the thing. And And let's be honest, a decade ago, I was still broke. Yeah. I did it for 10 years and I was a pretty damn good coach 10 years ago. You know, I didn't know anything about business yet. And now, and now the challenge for me is growing the business and, and cultivating the relationships with my staff. You know, man, I, <laughs> my staff is unbelievable and not just my coaches, my coaches are unbelievable, but my leadership team, my, my VP of HR, she is a true, you know, when I think about like in the corporate world, when I was coming up, HR is not a position. It's not people you want to deal with. Right. She is incredible and she's a true liaison for the clients and the coaches. As a matter of fact, I call her the VP of HR. She, her official title is she's the VP of internal relations. So she, she basically, she cultivates relationships within the business with the clients and with the coaches. And then I, you know, the same thing, I've just got this, I've got people who oversee the quality of coaching. Like we don't just, we, we bring on incredible coaches, but then we continue to try to not, not be big brother and look over their shoulder, but to continue to help give our coaches resources to help make them better coaches. And not just like, hey, here's an article to read or here's a, here's a video to watch. Lots of one-on-one calls. We walk through things like, the, like efficiency of work. Like what's your, let's check your internet speed. Do you have a good workstation? Is your monitor big enough? You know, how, is, how are you giving feedback to your clients? Remember, we give feedback every 24 hours, no matter what to our clients. So it's not just about, programming as a matter of fact programming for us is clearly secondary to the actual coaching that we do and so i couldn't do any of that so i've got a vp of marketing that understands everything about seo and she's a coach for me that's the other thing it wasn't somebody that i had to hire from outside the business it was somebody that went to school for seo was already doing this for a major firm lives in california was coaching for us and was like i can do this for you and then we started to cultivate that and so i'm in a great position my salespeople are awesome my chief administrator is awesome like you know that they all do a better job at their job than I could ever do at their job. And it's weird to think about two years ago, I did all those jobs. I was the guy that did that because I was it. I was, it was a sole proprietorship and I had some coaches and I was the quote unquote employee. And so now that we're a, we're a staff, we have nine full-time employees and we have another, you know, 55 or 56 coaches and then some additional like part-time people, administrators and producers and things like that. It is, uh, it's sort of running a great big ship but I could never do it without them. It's not, this is nothing, you know, I am very lucky that I, I had the relationships ahead of time to be able to sort of start to choose wonderful people to work at this business. And that's the reason we've done so well. Well, and it speaks volumes to the journey that you've been through to now be in a spot to be the leader that you can, t- can run this ship, right? To recognize like, yeah, these people do it 10 times better than I could ever or that I did do it. So yeah, let them do their thing, right? Like that's a big moment in a leader's career to really say like, yeah, I could do that. I've been doing it. I have some value attachment to it, but like, you're really good at this. Go do you, right? That's and right. like, that's what you're, you're giving props to all your people. And like, that's what I love about it. And when you, you mentioned it earlier, and I don't know if everybody's going to understand, but what is, what is churn? And what are you guys measuring churn? Sure. So churn is the percentage of your clients that leave every month. Okay. 
And in businesses like ours, and I would, you know, I know you guys have, you guys have the Stripe thing all set up for your coaches and stuff yet or no? Do you not have the like, point, point of sale? Okay, but you're working on that, right? So one of the things that was big for us is that we, we are an automated monthly recurring revenue business, right? Like I'm, we don't sell three months a time and then go after a client and be like, hey, want to do another three months? Because now they have to think about, well, was it really worth it? Do I want to write another check? Whatever, right? It's just automatically, boom, boom, and then they pay auto every month. And so for an, for an internet automatic monthly recurring revenue company, right? Like ours, especially service business, average churn is going to run about 10, per, you're going to lose about 10% per month of your clients. So if you've got 100 clients, you're going to lose 10 of them a month, right? If you get over 10%, you're way in the danger zone because now you got to replace all those people, right? Losing 10, if I lose 10% of my clients per month, I have to replace 100% of my clients in 10 months. But if my churn is 4%, then I get to keep clients for two years before I have to replace those clients. And then here's the thing, that's even sort of, that's sort of skewed shorter than it should be because what we do when you sign up is you sign up for, a, it's a three month contract and it's month to month after that. And we do that because I can't really change your life and strength and conditioning in 30 days. And for those of you guys that have, are coaches and you, you've done this before, it's a tremendous amount of work that first month. You're not really making money that first month because there's so much of the kind of get to know you process and let's fix all the big major like catastrophes and whatnot. And so we want to keep people for 90 days. If we can't keep them after 90 days, that's usually on us. But here's what I've found. Lots of people, they're, you know, it's like the January 1st type people. We'll, we have a handful of people that will sign up three-month contract, and then never really do the program. They never really do it. They never buy in. They never get it. Those people churn after three months or four months. But if they stay for month four and five for us, they never leave. They say, so really, it's not even that they stay for 24. It's that the average stay is 24 months. Most of my people, once they've stayed for four, five, six months, stay forever. Stay for three years, four years. They just never leave. And so that churn number is huge. And so you think about everybody's always thinking about sales and marketing, sales and marketing, sales and marketing. If you sell a bunch of new memberships and you get a bunch of new clients, but you lose a bunch of clients every month, net is zero, net is negative, whatever. What really matters is what is that net? And so, you know, for us, on average, we've added between 8% and 10% clients per month and lost 4 to 5%. So it comes out to a net 3 4 5% per month growth. And that's what we're looking to do every month. And so and in the first couple of years, it was significantly faster than that. But now at a multi-million dollar business with thousands of clients, you know, we're still growing on average 5%, 6% or so, 7% per month, which is pretty good. Nice. Talk to us about that secret sauce. That, that what, what is that? What keeps that churn so low? What builds the relationship so well? And what are you preaching to your coaches? Like in order to be a Barbell Logic coach, what is, what, what's the experience you guys are creating? Talk, talk to us that. Yeah, those are all good questions. Uh, so, so first off, this thing kind of starts with, I am a systems and standard operating procedures guy. And that sounds boring, right? Like um, to run a business that's based in systems, somebody actually has to sit down and write the technical writing, the systems, the SOPs, right? And nobody wants to do that. Um, but here's the thing, you, you talking earlier, you had mentioned, you know, hey, I'm talking about my coaches and stuff. Um, and, and to find the leadership that do better at their job than I could do. And I have found that you can, you can, you've probably heard this quote before, but there's a, there's a quote that says you can have control or you can have growth, but not both. Right. And for me, I recognize if we were going to have growth, I had to give up control. And what that meant is you can't be a micromanager, but what it doesn't mean is that there, can, there are always systems and standard operating procedures for every, for every single position we have clear responsibilities and expectations for every employee, for every 1099 coach, for every coach we have, all of those things exist. And so while, while it sounds sort of boring to say, it all starts from there because, you know, I wrote the system for how to run the administration part. And then when I hired my admin, I got to turn that system over to the admin and say, this is your system now. My, my system, this is a great place to start. It's probably not perfect. You'll figure out the places that I've screwed this up. You'll clean it up and make it better. And they have ownership in that system. And so they have some real responsibility and they, they love to be able to do that. And so it starts with, we are very organized, extremely organized, uh, but it keeps me from having to micromanage. And so everybody has like simple reports that they report back. And it's not the kind of, we don't spend a bunch of time on the, you know, quote unquote TPS reports and you spend all your time writing. Like that's, that's worthless, right? 
my leadership team has to spend about 60 seconds a day reporting back to me. And they spend about 10 to 15 minutes per week at the end of the week doing sort of a weekend review. And then we do the same thing at the end of the month. We do the same thing at the end of the quarter. And it's, it doesn't take much time. As a matter of fact, it takes me significantly more time to sort of combine their weekly reports into one report every week and do the same thing monthly. But it, it allows me to have a pulse on the business without micromanaging the business. And so that's how we run the sort of, um, you know, the administration and executive team that C-suite does a really good job. The coaches, man, it's all about culture. We're, we are a culture intentional company. We are a company that is a, we have focused all along on, I went out and got coaches who were already great coaches who already understood the physics and the biomechanics of coaching. And then I brought them into a business that was a people culture. We are all about people. We're all about service. And so the thing that we can do, and I, and so here's the deal. I think we're the best coaches in the world. Listen, I know there are other great coaches out there and that's not, I'm not shitting on other coaches, but every coach that works for me is an incredible coach. But I've also worked with a lot of good coaches in the strength and conditioning community, and most of them aren't very good at service. And we're great at service. And so the thing is, is that they come for the service because the service is great, and they'll often stay long term because their progress is so good. They hit PRs, they reach their goals, they do it, but like they can't reach their goals in two weeks. Why do they love it at two weeks? They love it at two weeks because you spent time, you set up the Zoom call with them, and you introduced them. We walk people through the on-ramp process of how to get on true coach, how to accept your invitation, how to do your test workout. That kind of started that on-ramp is huge for us. Like we we've created an entire, you know, I know you guys offer like a, a video library. We have an entire video library that, that we offer. I, I mean, hundreds of videos that we've made that we give our clients. So anytime you, we prescribe any exercise, we have our own videos that plug in there. So our clients can look at it and be like, Oh, this is how coach wants me to do the thing. And so, so that goes a long way. Um, and then we make sure that we don't just focus when we coach on the X's and the O's. The coaches are great at the X's and the O's. But at some point, if you don't reach out to your clients and go, hey, how are you doing in the quarantine? How's life? How's business? How's family? Are you stuck in the house with the family? You're not used to it. Or is that going okay? You know, have you been laid off from your job? How's, what's work look like? Those are questions that a coach should be asking of their client. And, and for several reasons. One, because again, you're making those deposits into their emotional 401k. But the other thing is this, just like we said in the beginning, isn't our primary job to continue to add stress to our clients to make them better and stronger or the performance goals they want? And here's the thing. If you don't have a relationship with your client, you don't know when they get in a, in a fight with their wife. You don't know when they had a miscarriage. You don't know when they got laid off from their job. And you better know that stuff as a coach. Those are important things to know because if somebody stayed up all night long fighting with their wife or they feel like they're about to get laid off from their job or they fought with their boss or like whatever that is, or they even they got a kid stay up all night long throwing up because their little kid was sick. Those are stressful things, stressful events that their body doesn't understand how different that is than putting a barbell on your back. But we better understand that that has a major impact. And so you have to have that relationship with the clients. And so in the end, I think that when you get into a situation like now where everybody's in quarantine and 30 or 40% of our clients can't squat and can't deadlift and do those things that we sort of build our entire business on, they stay. And they stay because we've spent all the time developing the relationships outside of the squat and outside of the deadlift. Squats and deadlift are still extremely important. We don't think you can get strong without barbells. That's, those, are, those are foundational ideas for us. But that doesn't mean that we can't still provide value and support and encouragement for our clients, even in times when they can't barbell squat or, or deadlift. And so I think that's why our churn is so low. It's that, that culture is we are a people company. and We take care of not just our clients. We take care of our clients like crazy. The leadership team takes care of our staff. My staff, they matter to us. I, I am... I am deeply concerned over the impact that coronavirus is having on my staff, you know, and, and for some, it doesn't have any impact. And for some, it has a lot. And so we're trying to provide as much support and encouragement and value for those coaches, because even as a business, if I can't provide that value to my coaches, they go coach somewhere else or they go coach on their own. And for us, we provide this turnkey service. It's like, man, you get tons of support. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to worry about bounce credit cards. We hand you your clients. Clients sign up and we assign them, you know, and 
it's just it's beautiful and, and we can because of all those things because of professionalism what we do we can charge a premium that you probably couldn't charge on your own so then your take-home pay and we pay pretty good we pay 70 percent ish somewhere in that ballpark plus um and for the master's classes and the academy it's even more than that and so it's a pretty good take-home pay so the coaches end up taking home more than they they would probably even be able to charge and there's no work to do but coach they just get to coach and develop the relationships with their clients and so i think that's why it works so well 100 percent. you know to build a, re- a successful remote relationship though there there is a level of compliance that you do need to get from the client especially when you guys are working with such technical uh, proficiencies with, with movement. And so there is an element of having to do some education and getting some buy-in for that coach or for to get that client to like video themselves doing a, a movement. And that's not necessarily a comfortable thing for everyone. How are you, how are you or your coaches coaching their clients to be okay with like putting themselves on video? Yep. Yeah. It's a great question. Uh, it's part, I think at this point in the beginning, it was a little more difficult because not everybody knew we did that. Now, this is sort of the thing we do. And so it's in the, it, it's in the original on-ramp instructions. We also offer a service. We have so many people that just ask about our service that we decided to start giving people sort of a taste of our service for free. We call it the block experience. We have a sales team. Their job is not to close a sale for the block experience. Their, their job is to literally just give people a, an experience of what it's like to be a member at block. And so that people can actually video themselves for the block experience totally free. There's no hard sell at the end. There's no buy up stuff. And they just video themselves squatting, deadlifting, doing the, same, the main movements. And then, our, and then one of our coaches does a Zoom call with them and walks them through the form corrections. And so they get like a taste of what we do anyway. And so, yeah, by the time people come on, most people know that they're going to video themselves. Occasionally, we get somebody that doesn't. Occasionally, we get somebody that goes to a public gym where the public gym doesn't allow that sort of thing. And we've got to make changes or, you know, occasionally even refund somebody. But it's pretty rare. Uh, but again, a lot of our people train at home and they video themselves. And then here's what we found. We switched a couple years ago. Uh, so we no longer give or rarely give written typed feedback to our clients. We started using uh, screen recorders. And so what we do is we actually sh- we pull up our, our client who is squatting. So they upload their videos to True Coach. We directly on our either dashboard or notifications, and we, by the way, we fight on the staff. Our staff is this, we're like team dashboard versus team notifications. I don't know if you heard this before, but like who, who, you know, do you You're very popular dashboard? with our customer success team. Yeah. Yeah. So do you do the <laughs> dashboard and then, and then back check the dashboard with the notifications or do you do the notifications, then back check it with the, fa- with the dashboard. But anyway, what, in whatever view they're using, they will see the, the, see the client videos, right? See the squat. And then they get to, the coaches record them watching their client squat and they're just the way I'm doing to you right now. I'm talking on my podcast setup and I'm walking my clients through and I pause. Oopsie, your knees slid forward right there. You're on your toes now. You're not on your midfoot. We also have, you know, we have all sort of markup um, software, you know, like the, like people use on like Monday night football and you can, you can, you can draw directly on the screen. Like, check this out. Your back is rounded. We don't want this sort of rounding. We want arched and this is arched, like the opposite of cat back and you can kind of draw it for them. And so, I think they love that feedback and it, we, we had a massive change in sort of, sort of NPS score type stuff. So the, the satisfaction that our current clients were getting when we switched from typed reviews to spoken reviews, because every morning I get up, I drink coffee and I'm basically talking to my clients yeah. as I'm breaking down their video. So it feels way more personal. You know, I'm on the podcast and I'm on the YouTube channel and stuff. And so they hear my voice anyway. And I think it's cool for them. Like, Oh man, it's cool. Matt's actually breaking down my squat and I'm almost breaking down their squat as if I'm watching it live, yeah. you know, and I'm like, and sometimes I even joke about it. I was like, I said, hip drive. Why didn't you, you know, like <laughs> you know, in the past, they can't hear me. You know? I'm like, are you not listening to my cues? You know, no, it's just, totally. but yeah, that's the way you do it. And you get, and you tell jokes and you have fun and how's the family doing and is everybody staying safe and healthy. And so again, it all comes back to that relationship. The coaching is imperative. Uh, but I do think there are lots of other good coaches out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the service is the thing that puts us over the top. By the way, I think there are a lot of other companies that probably don't offer very good coaching that don't know what the hell they're doing in the fitness industry, but may offer really good service, right? You think about those boutique type fit personal training studios that your mom goes to or your grandma. They don't have any clue how to actually get your mom or your grandma in shape, but the service is incredible, right? glass of wine, little tea towel, like whatever. Well, when I first opened the gym, I was like, why can't we be like that? And then just still train hardcore. And yeah. we've done the same thing at Barbell Logic with the, with the online coaching. It's like, our people train hard with barbells. It gets, it's at, we, we talk about voluntary hardship. It's one of the hardest things you're ever going to do. 
the coaching quality and the coaching excellence is fantastic, but we don't ever do those things at, at, uh, at the expense of service. So yeah. it's the combination of the two. That's the winning combination for us. Well, you know, I'm, I'm so blessed that I, my first lens of fitness was powerlifting, was linear progression, was that progressive overload. And to go through, and I did uh, four powerlifting meets, uh, one strongman meet and two Olympic weightlifting meets. And like from a fitness standpoint, like I think it's really important for every trainer to learn how to go out and get strong, right? Sure. And what it takes. And like, yeah, you to, to put yourself under 102% under that barbell and know that you have to go down and gravity back up. Like that is a mental fortitude and a, a drive. Like that moment for so many people whether they either choose to get in or get out, like Nothing I think I felt in my life is comparable to that with a big, heavy back squat. That's right. right? The bottom of the position, you're like, you, you have that little second in your head where you're like, oh, I can, uh, or no, I'm pressing through. Yeah. And like, that's life. And I'm like, but, you're, like this might, you're like, this might kill me, <laughs> right? Yeah, to totally. But it's like, right. it's so much fun. And I'm like, I don't power lift anymore, but like, I love that I had, it was such a good time and I really enjoy the training. And it's still like, I mean, really, I, I mostly train spot people here and there, like athletes yeah. here and there once in a while. And it's still like, all right, we have our primary bilateral thing. And I'd still use a conjugate style breakdown, like of how a program would look. Cause I'm like, that's how I'm used to training. Like, all right, we have our vertical pressing. We got some horizontal pressing. We got some horizontal rowing. We got some, and I'm like, and you just plug and play. Right. But it teaches you how to at least operate and understand stress to like, oh, you understand what the stress of a workout incurs on a body when you're lifting at those high loads where you're like, that's right. yeah a bad night of sleep really messes with that day. Like deadlifting is not going to go well tomorrow, right? Like and at night you might have a good day, but like, so it's just a great lesson. So if there's, I also want to point out guys, what maybe you're not the biggest strength coaches or you've been in, like, you don't necessarily believe in lifting heavy, like beyond that. I, it's a great lesson to go through. Don't, you don't have to do it forever, but I'm so blessed that it came, like it built so much of a foundation of my career. I would heavily encourage if you're looking for something to do in fitness, to learn, have an experience, Sign up for a powerlifting meter too. Go through it. Learn about what it's like. Doesn't mean you have to do it forever or coach it, but to learn about it is the foundation of what our industry is. Yep. Right? Our industry is built off of getting people stronger, right, and human performance. That's right. And uh, to yeah, we think strength. We think strength is the basis of everything, right? So that strength, as you get stronger makes all of the other attributes better. You think about those, you know, the 10 qualities from CrossFit or, or what, it, like strength is the one thing that makes all the other ones better. Not to the be all end all, like you can't just squat and then go run a marathon. It's not going to work. But if you take a sedentary person who has not done anything and they do three sets of five on squat week in and week out, they are going to be in better cardiovascular uh, shape. It's, it's guaranteed. And then coming back to the point you just made, I would never hire a coach who hasn't walked through the fire of this sort of training. And I want to be clear, I, co I don't care at all how strong the coach is, mm -hmm. right? Strength is important to us. I say that, like, obviously on some level, yeah. you know, I don't want him to be a, you know, just a complete <laughs> weakling. But, but in, the, in the genetic spectrum, I have coaches who are very much on the far left of the genetic spectrum, right? They are not athletes. Mm -hmm. they, have, they have verticals of nine inches or something, you know, <laughs> but they've all done linear progression. Uh -huh. They've all lifted heavy. And so I think it is a fallacy. There's two ends of that spectrum. There is, I would not take coaching from somebody who hasn't walked through that fire. Totally. But I also recognize that, you know, maybe Ronnie Coleman wasn't the best bodybuilding coach. And maybe, you know, these guys in the world's strongest man are probably not the best strength coaches in the world because when you take, I'm not throwing any in particular person under the bus, but when you take genetics and drugs and all these sort of things and you put it like, and then you're trying to apply that to the 45 year old executive, it doesn't work. But when you have other coaches who are also potentially 45 year old executives who are ex surgeons, who are ex attorneys, who are engineers, and they've done linear progression and they've squatted heavy and they've deadlifted heavy and they've walked through that fire and maybe their squat isn't 500 pounds. Maybe it's 275 or 300 pounds or 315. Maybe their deadlift is 300 pounds or 400 pounds and not 700 pounds, they still know what they're asking of you when they program you. And in a, in a thing like linear progression, linear progression is a blast for about six weeks. And then the <laughs> second six weeks sucks, right? Because you're like, oh man, I just squatted 265 for three sets of five on Wednesday and it almost killed me. And I'm going to come in on Friday and I'm going to put five more pounds on the bar. You better know as a coach what that feels like. 
you like you don't sleep well on Thursday night because you know you got to get up on Friday and squat five more pounds. You're like, it, I don't know if I can do it, you know. And then you start to squat it, and you got the music playing in the gym, and it drops an octave while you, you, know, you talk about getting in the bottom of the squat, and that music like da 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 and your eyes go from like, I can see fine to all of a sudden it's red, to all of a sudden it's black and I can't see anything in the butt. You know, you should know what that feels like because you're going to have to walk your clients through that. Listen, a, a 22 year old ex division one athlete doesn't get scared with that stuff. But a 65 year old lady, the first time she gets dizzy in the bottom of a squat, she is going to freak out and you better know how to walk her through. It's okay. You're going to be okay. I'm right here. We use squat racks. We have safety pins. We're like those sort of things matter. And yes, I know what it feels like because I've been there too. And it is kind of scary at first. And then you realize like you'll be okay, you know? And so, gosh, you have to walk through that fire. Yeah, I think, and I don't know if it's not talked about enough, or at least maybe I just don't see it or I don't look for it enough, but teaching people how to learn how to fail a lift sure. is not taught enough. No. It's like you see, you're like, oh, oh, that, oh, that was an interesting solution to fixing that yeah. problem. Right, yeah. and you're like, oh, that like that needs to be a better education system from the get go. Right. Like, if you're at the bottom of the squat and you are, you know, you're not coming back up. What's your strategy if there's no pins? Right, That's right. And there better you, be pins. There better be, yeah. Like, I'll fire you if there's no pins. <laughs> well, and think about it, think about it this way: there's different ways to do squats, right? So you think about it, you watch those Olympic athletes, and the most and most Olympic weightlifters genetically are short legged and long torsoed, so they automatically squat more upright right? You don't even have to understand the physics. Just know that they're like very vertical torso. Well, a very vertical torso squat, you, you can't get up out of the hole. What can you do with the bar? I just throw it off my back, especially if there's bumper plates on, just throw it off. Well, if you're, if you're a short torso lifter and a long legged lifter or a low bar squat lifter and you're bent way over and you're really horizontal, guess what happens when you throw it off your back? It lands on your sacrum. It doesn't go to the ground. Right. So you can't you can't throw a low bar squat off your back. You have to set it on the pins. And so we don't allow any clients to squat in a in a like they have to have a squat rack with safeties, period. Like we no questions asked. That's the way that's the way this works. Now, if somebody doesn't have it in the beginning, we don't take them heavy. We do stuff that's like way low. We don't really use RPE and programming, but for purposes of like it's RPE five, six, whatever, like there's no chance they're going to miss the thing. We might do that, and then we're like, listen, we got to buy some safeties. We're going to get a better, a better setup with, that we take that stuff serious. And bench press, same thing. Like, we don't let people bench press without, like, you think about it, like, bench press is more dangerous than the squat, right? You can't get it up. You got to put it on your throat. So there better be a place to catch that bar. So we're, we, that's another thing that, you know, we spend a lot of time on the, that uh, content we put out, focusing on safety and making sure people are doing it right, make sure people know how to miss correctly. And then there's things like the deadlift where people – there's a governor in your brain when you pull a heavy deadlift that when it starts to get real heavy, you'll pick it up and it'll still be going up, but it'll go slow and you'll be like, uh, uh-uh, and you just put it down. And then we have to have that talk with our clients that go, Hey, I need five seconds of grind on this thing. Your back was flat. It was fine. It wasn't rounded. You're not going to hurt yourself. It's just hard and hard is what we're doing. That's what we do. There's a refining process for us far beyond the physical of this voluntary hardship of lifting, we, we have seen it refine our people, not just physically, but mentally, emotionally, spiritually, socially, all of those things. If they're doing it for the right reasons, they become better humans out of it. Right. So that, and then here's the thing we choose voluntary hardship for most of our life and training so that when we're stuck with involuntary hardship, you know, like when we're laid off from our job in the middle of the coronavirus or when you get sick with the coronavirus or like these things that we're experiencing right now, we're better able to handle the stress because we forced ourselves to do these hard things. And so we've talked a lot to our clients over the last few weeks, like this is why we train for this very type of thing, right? Um, so it's, it matters to us. And, and we, we consider all of those things on a little deeper level, I think, than a lot of people do. Not that, not anybody, but like, I do think it's more than just lifting. I don't, you know, we don't have a bunch of meatheads and we're not just squatting. We're squatting for a purpose. We're squatting for a quality of life. I have a lady that I coach. She's 84 years old. She's had double hip replacement, knee replacement. Her, she's a backs all fused together. You know, she's like a church organist. I trained her since she was 79. She had never been in a gym before until she was 79. I trained her son and I started training her. Miss Sybil is her name. She's awesome. And I am, and this is going to sound morbid, but, but I'm serious about it. Sybil's quality of life was declining tremendously when I started to coach her. She had a hard time getting off the toilet. She couldn't get in and out of her car and her brain, I mean, incredibly sharp, 
but her body was dying. And so, and her kids don't live here in town. She'd been a widow for like seven years. She was all by herself. Her next stop was the nursing home. And she trained this way. She squats, she deadlifts. By the way, she deadlifts, she's 84 years old. She down deadlifts like 155 for sets of five. She's 84, right? Uh, here's the thing. Yeah, and I'll get choked up when I think about it. But like Sybil's quality of life was going to decline over the next three, four, five years and she was going to die. Instead, I don't know when Sybil's going to die, but here's what I know. Her quality of life is going to be fucking awesome until she does. And then one day she's going to die. And that's the way I want to die. I don't want to see, I don't want to be in hospice and watch my, yeah, have my body waste away for six, seven, eight years. And so this stuff matters. Again, when you're 22, what, how about when you're 17, you're just trying to like make, be a starter on the football team. That's important to you. But like in the grand scheme of things, it really matters to this population. And so we have a population that we can improve their quality of life tremendously so that their marriage is better, dealing with their kids and their grandkids are better, interacting with kids and grandkids. They're better at work. They're better recovered. They get better sleep. Those things matter as they get older in, 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 in life, you know? And so, uh, so that's, that's what we're pursuing and that's what we try to do. And I think that's why I have so much joy in training people who are, who are 40 plus 35 plus, um, and not so much the young, but, and by the way, let me, before I say that we train young people too, we've got, we've got programs. My dogs are going nuts. I guess I'll be at my door. Uh, we train young people too. We've got youth programs and high school programs. And we have coaches that are like crazy passionate about that stuff. And we, and because they're incredible coaches, we allow them to do that passion. We call it, it's that hub and spoke model. It's we're the hub and they figure out how to take our, our system and, and run it out on the spoke. But that's not where my passion is. My passion is with training 50 year old men and women. And it's, and it's great. And I love it. So um, it's brought me a lot of joy for sure. Well, and it shows, right? Like, you know, I, and I think that people need to, uh, I want people to understand that when you reach success in the industry to where you can be in a spot where you can like, oh, I have a great team now. I'm in a spot like that comes out of an appreciation because Matt's been grinding for a lot of the career, right? Yeah. Like you do it because you love it. And I love that he's just right now is just overtly passionate that he just does this because he cares about helping people. And it's that reason, it's that relationship that he's built where he genuinely gives a fuck about his employees and they care about their clients to what they have the business that they have. So if you're a coach listening to this, wondering like, how do I make it in this game? I know you didn't hear us give you like, do this thing or have this program or do this style. It was like, hey, if you're gonna put out content, put out content that's like a value, care about it. Have something that people care about and what they need and have an audience that you want to help that you're qualified to help and then deliver an experience. Like, look how Matt talks about it. Like no one else is doing this. He recognized other people do good businesses, but he's like, no one else is doing this because we're doing a kick-ass job and they are. 4% churn, guys, holy shit, right? When it's, when, when the message is with the barbell and they are, I mean, it's a smaller audience than like general fitness, right? Mm-hmm. And I love the audience, I come from the audience. And it's like, oh shit, but look what they're doing. They're providing this service, this relationship, this value that they're killing it. And that's something that most coaches need to take away is like, oh, how do I add that service into my game? How do I add that relationship building piece into my game? Because, you know, if it's the bar, like we, we won't, I want you to be with the barbell. I want you to learn to get strong. But if you're doing it because you're reaching pre and postnatal and you don't use a barbell and you, but you like do it, would build a really great relationship. Put up right. content that women and women and men, you know, need to hear about pre and postnatal and that family, whatever that is, and show people you're an expert and treat people like you care. And that's how you build a business like Barbell Logic to where you can have an amazing staff of kick-ass people and where he's like, man, I got a bunch of people that make me look good, right? right. And then now I get to sit here and like, oh man, now he literally gets to put his care into like, I care about my members. I care about my employees who are affected because of those members. Yep. He's not having to worry about like, oh shit, am I okay? Right? He had, he had the fucking virus and he's wondering about his people and his business. So that's relationship, man. That's why these guys, this, that's why they do the great business. That's why they are who they are. Matt, thank you so much for joining us, man. It Thanks, was dude. a pleasure to get to chat with you. Where can people learn more about Barbell Logic? Barbell Logic, easy, right? If you can't find us, then uh, it's, you don't deserve to learn. <laughs> so it's, uh, I, listen, I bragged on my marketing girl. Listen, our SEO rocks. You, if you put in the word barbell, I, we're like, we're in the top one or two. Barbell Logic, anywhere, barbellogic.com, Barbell Logic on all the social media, Barbell Logic on YouTube, easy to find. I'm at Reynolds Strong on Instagram. Uh, and some of the social media, I, at this point, again, it's been really crazy. I've mostly transitioned over to just, uh, it's, it was some, there was an incredible amount of freedom when the business uh, eclipsed me 
in uh, followers and subscribers and stuff. And I'm like, I don't have to be that guy anymore. You know, I can just like actually be private and it's fine. And so, yeah, check it out. And, and certainly, uh, I know a lot of your coaches. So we've got a lot of great, um, a lot of great content out there for you. Those of you guys that are true coach users, please use our videos in the true coach library. They're fantastic. Pull them off of YouTube, stick them in there. Um, happy to, to provide those to anybody we've got. And we, and at this point we've got body weight stuff, kettlebell stuff, all the barbell stuff, anything you'd ever want to do in a million years with a barbell, we've got all that stuff. And so utilize that as much as possible. Barbell logic podcast is a systematic progression of learning this business and the, and the fitness industry. And so you, I would start with episode one and start working. You're like, why strength? Why barbells? Why squats? Like those. And it's, and now it's like much more in depth, 300 episodes later, it's a lot more in depth, but, uh, yeah, there's all sorts of fun resources out there for you. And, and it's, it's been very satisfying for us that at this point I have that library of content that I've built. So if, again, if something happens to me, my kids, my grandkids, you know, people that know me, they can go back and they can be like, well, this is what dad was all about. Like he's all like just about everything I've known. I know at this point I've put out there, you know, I don't have a lot more to talk about. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, check us out, barbellogic.com, and uh, would, you know, would love to help you out anyway. You're always welcome to shoot me an email. Again, emails are easy to find on the website, and uh, happy to help anybody I can. Dude, thank you so much for the time. It was a pleasure. Glad you're safe and sound, and we're able to have this chat. And looking forward to getting together with you and, and getting some uh, banks my iron together. I'd love to learn from you. So yeah. uh, enjoy your time, brother, and make sure your friends and family are safe and, and enjoy your day. Thank you, you too. See you, buddy.